Hello, my name is David George for George Charter Building Surveyors. This is another short briefing. It relates to dilapidations. It's, um, it's really directed towards tenants who, from my experience, often don't get enough guidance prior to taking on the lease or indeed at the end of the lease, and so do get into some slight tricky situations with the landlord. Um, it's not really therefore directed towards property professionals who have some knowledge and experience of dilapidations. You'll hopefully be aware of the briefing that I put together for uh, pre-purchase uh, preoccupation surveys where I made reference to the review of leases and repairing obligations. Um, the assessment of the building's condition in relation to the tenant's repairing obligations leads us nicely on to the issue of dilapidations, this fundamentally being the assessment of the tenant's obligations, where they fail to comply with those obligations and how the landlord might go about achieving a remedy or obtaining compensa compensation. There are many aspects of dilapidations, including legal precedents, statutory acts such as the Landlord and Tenant Act, and civil procedural rules, and the, and the RICS guidance notes, which are far too complex to go into as part of a briefing. Um, but of course, you can contact us if you need further information. Of course, those are really the domain of the surveyor or solicitor acting for the landlord or tenant. So who need to be aware of potential dilapidation issues? Well, um, I've already mentioned that the uh, condition of the building and the potential for dilapidations is a valuable inclusion uh, to any pre-acquisition, pre-purchase survey, uh, whether landlord or tenant. Um, obviously, the landlord will, will want to monitor the, uh, any disrepair during the course of the lease and may be in a position to enforce repair both during the lease, this referred to as an interim schedule, or towards the end of the lease. In fact, many times within the last three years of a standard commercial tenancy. Um, this being referred to as a terminal schedule of dilapidations. Um, I, I say may be able to uh, enforce as uh, tenant obligations are outlined in the lease and do vary uh, and can be limited for example by schedule of condition and there are also statutory mechanisms to some degree limiting landlords actions. In addition to the issue of a schedule of dilapidations there are other mechanisms such as repair notices, repair notices which I won't go into at this stage. So it's the lease which prescribes the extent of the tenant's obligations to repair, including to some degree the nature of the repair, the quality, etc. Um, other issues which would need to be considered might include reinstating the building, again in accordance with the lease, for example, removal of partitions, uh, which can significantly affect the level of internal repairs subsequently re required. Also, the effect and impact of statutory obligations, which are usually the responsibility of the tenant, including managing asbestos in the building, upgrading the fabric where necessary to comply with, for example, health and safety or fire safety standards, and maintaining mechanical and electrical systems in accordance with statutory obligations. Uh, as previously mentioned, there are a number of protocols, uh, statutory requirements, etc., when preparing uh, both interim and terminal schedules of dilapidations, such as the civil procedure rules and the RICS guidance notes, um, which dictate when and how the schedule should be produced, presented and served, uh, which is critical to ensure success in enforcing a tenant's obligations. An incorrectly served notice or schedule, um, or not being served uh, in accordance with protocols, can result in an unsuccessful claim and potentially even costs incurred by the landlord. It's also worth noting that interim schedules are often difficult to enforce due to, again, legislation such as the, the uh, Leasehold Property Repairs Act, which was introduced to protect uh, tenants against the ability of the landlord to enforce unnecessary uh, works mid-term. Um, as such, landlords are generally faced with dilapidation issues, primarily at the end of the lease. Historically, landlords have been accused of inflated claims, often where the tenants uh, have vacated. Um, the protocols referred to earlier were introduced to rein in landlords and indeed surveyors. And to be honest, uh, this does seem to have been successful. There are other imposed restrictions to ensure a schedule and claim are reasonable. A claim should not represent more than the landlord's loss. Again, there are, are processes in place to establish uh, which I won't go uh, into at this stage. There may also be circumstances where the landlord has actually suffered no loss whatsoever, this relating to the property value. Um, and for example, if the building has been relet prior to um, agreeing any dilapidations. Uh, diminution value, valuations, i.e. the assessment of the reduction in the value of the, of the property and issues of supersession are not something I'll cover here. So, 
a reasonable and compliant terminal schedule of dilapidation served either prior to the end of the lease or within what is generally uh, accepted as a reasonable period following the end of the lease um, should result in either works being undertaken by the tenant or a reasonable settlement for dilapidations being achieved, which would ideally be reinvested by the landlord into the building's condition, thus ensuring the building is maintained in sound condition and hopefully safeguarding the investment value. However, dilapidation matters aren't always dealt with as the protocols would prefer. The tenant is likely to want to approach dilapidations in a slightly different manner. Often, um, this being a hide your head in the sand and leave the building quietly, hoping the landlord won't notice, and occasionally this does actually work. Often the same tenant has not obtained suitable advice at the beginning of the lease, either in the form of a survey or uh, alternatively just as an assessment of the likely dilapidations at the end of the lease, and is unlikely to have ameliorated any, uh, any such matters by, for example, asking the landlord to carry out repairs, agreeing a contribution of repairs, or even, less desirably, establishing a schedule of condition, this limiting the level of repair required. Um, this is particularly important in the case of lease assignment, where the tenant effectively accepts earlier disrepair as their own. So, what action should be taken to avoid disputes? If you're the landlord, encourage the tenant to repair the building throughout the term of the lease. Secondly, if absolutely necessary, issue correct proportionate schedules of dilapidations, ideally after gen gentle encouragement has first been attempted. And if you're the tenant, well, firstly, obtain suitable advice at the start of a tenancy. Ask the landlord to rectify any disrepair or agree a package of compensation to allow you as the tenant to carry out that repair. Secondly, maintain the building during the course of the lease term. And thirdly, during but certainly towards the end of the lease term, assess potential dilapidation liabilities, repair the building accordingly, or initiate early discussions with the landlord to agree the parameter of such repairs, or alternatively, uh, of a financial settlement, all ideally with the assistance of a chartered building surveyor. Thanks very much for watching.